get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, on behalf of the International Health Institute and the School of Public Health here at Brown University, I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel discussion tonight on the ongoing novel coronavirus outbreak. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think this is going to be a really informative and interesting discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to thank several people for making this night possible. Um, first of all, Brown University, the School of Public Health, Brown Medical School, and the Rhode Island Department of Health for their support. And specifically, we'd like to thank the Dean's Office and Communication Team here at the School of Public Health, as well as the Office for Global Engagement at Brown for their help in coordinating tonight's panel. Uh, my name is Angie Bankson, and I'm going to be one of the moderators tonight with my colleague, Dr. Mark Lurie. Both Mark and I are faculty here in the Department of Epidemiology, um, and this year I also had the added pleasure of teaching the Infectious Disease Epidemiology. So it has been quite a semester uh, for our class in learning about the coronavirus outbreak and following it. The novel coronavirus, or COVID-19 as it's now been named by the World Health Organization, has gained global attention since it first was reported in December of 2019. The speed and scale of the epidemic has been startling to watch. Just as of this morning, there were over 45,000 confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus, the vast majority of which are in Wuhan, China, or in the Hubei province. However, the virus has now spread to over 30 countries, and including the US, where there are 13 confirmed cases. As in all outbreaks, public health officials have a critical role to play in clearly, articul articulately, um, and transparently communicating information about what's known in the outbreak so that communities keep themselves safe. But we also have a role to play um, and a responsibility in being prepared for an outbreak. Um, and that's happening currently in China, as well as here more locally in Rhode Island and at Brown University. With all these activities, there needs to be special attention paid to um, balancing the need for preventing transmission and preparing for an outbreak with individual human rights, the needs and rights of communities, and efforts to avoid stigmatizing particular groups of people, communities, or regions of the world. So tonight we're here to have a discussion and share our multidisciplinary perspectives on this outbreak, its impact globally, and what it might mean for us here locally in Rhode Island. We're gonna have a lot of time for question and answer, um, and so I encourage you to be thinking about questions as the panelists uh, are giving their remarks. Um, so with that, why don't I introduce the panelists and I'll give you a little, a little bit of an overview of how we're going to proceed tonight. So we are joined tonight by Dr. Juin Tao, who's an assistant professor and infectious disease epidemiologist at Marion Hospital. Dr. Tao primarily works in HIV and STI. However, as part of her training, she's worked with the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, including colleagues who are working on the front lines of the epidemic. So she's going to give us some background and orientation to what's currently going on in the epidemic. And then we'll hear from Dr. Catherine Mason, who's an assistant professor here in the Department of Anthropology at Brown and a medical anthropologist. Dr. Mason is the author of a book uh, entitled Infectious Change, Reinventing Chinese Public Health After an Epidemic, based on her extensive work in China following the SARS epidemic in 2003. Uh, and recently, Dr. Mason's been writing and speaking about her experience with SARS as it might relate to the current coronavirus outbreak. We're also lucky to be joined by Dr. Phil Chan, who's an infectious disease physician and associate professor of medicine here at Brown. Dr. Chan's an expert in the prevention and treatment of HIV and STDs, and he serves as the consultant medical director to the Rhode Island Department of Health in a variety of infectious disease related issues. Finally, we're joined by Dr. Vanessa Brito, who's the associate vice president for campus life and executive director of health and wellness here at Brown in addition to being a board certified physician. Dr. Brito oversees several areas at Brown, including health services and emergency medical services um, at Brown. So she's going to give us a really good analysis. So we'll be moving from kind of global to local um, in our discussion tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Tao. everyone, it's my pleasure to be here and share information about 2019 novel coronavirus pneumonia outbreak in China. So as far as we know, there are seven coronavirus cases cause human disease. So these four actually only com cause common cold is mild, people can survive, and this is a SARS and MERS constant severe acute respiratory syndrome. So SARS was outbreak during 2002 to 2013 in China. Uh, 
and the verse was outbreak in 2012 in the Middle East. So um, the fatality rate was targeted almost around 10%, and the murder was around 34%. And the total case of SARS is only 8,400. Uh, 8, so MERS is only 2,400. And all those kind of virus, we believe uh, we come from the bat. The bat fight with the wet animals, and this wet animal transfer this virus to human beings. And for the 2019 uh, coronavirus, so this virus only share 80% of genetic similarity between SARS and the lower the MERS and all the other coronavirus. So that reason was named as novel coronavirus. So this virus like, uh, can cause like a huge respiratory disease, which can either go mild or out severe. So people who get infected will show symptoms like a fever, fatigue, muscle jumping and the full like symptoms like a sneezing, runny nose. So it makes super hard to differentiate from the flu. So this incubation um, period means so on the gap between the day people get uh, exposed until the time the disease onset. So based on like a study around the 425 patients, so they calculate the median time five days with a range from zero to 14 days. And recently, they just released another study based on thousand patients in Guangdong province. So their like meeting times can be as quick as three days, and the lungs can be 24 days. So based like on the statistics, actually more than 99 percent of patients will have symptoms, symptoms within 14 days. So that's the reason why currently, so the government recommends everyone who either have travel history or contact history with confirmed cases to stay at home for 14 days at that point. So the most common like a uh, 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 symptom was fever, so coughing. So one thing we need to be aware, actually only 43% of people have fever when they first taking care. And the fever was like delivered over on once they were admitted to the hospital. And 76% had pneumonia, and 30% or 16% cases were severe cases and 30% need ICU support. And compared to those like uh, mild cases, only 2% of people need ICU support. So the clinical diagnosis actually based on all the symptoms and the CT scan shows you have the pneumonia, uh, the viral pneumonia. And also the travel history to Wuhan or either have uh, like uh, intimate contact with people who have been diagnosed. So the laboratory, uh, like uh, the confirmation actually was based on the lab diagnosis. So the specimen was weak, like either the stroke symptom, pharyngeal loss. So the, confirm, uh, the confirmation case is, uh, is defined as having either a positive result, either sequencing or RT-PCR. But currently, this still is only 30 to 40 percent. It's not based on the estimation. So there will be a lot of several like a, like a reasons to um, for this low sensitivity. So the first, uh, so uh, this kind of viral in the virtual experiment, it took like 96 hours to detect this virus when we're using the, uh, the human respiratory uh, cellular cell for culture. So there's definitely a window time period for this virus. And the second, so it uh, depends on the air quality or the specimen during the collection. So sometimes you know, there's a lot of people actually collecting the samples, so quality can vary. And third, this patient, uh, this virus actually is RNA virus. It's very easy to deactivate. So during the transportation, it can be deactivated. Like, uh, and the, the first one, actually, the quality of the testing agent. This agent was actually developed based on the sequencing. We know they limited information about the viral features. Uh, and usually, we have, we, uh, for a testing patient, a testing case, we need uh, like a uh, time to run their performance testing before they will use the uh, for the clinical diagnosis, but this time because it's outbreak, so we really don't have time. So the quantity of the testing agents are also a problem. But the specificity is highly, it's, it's very high, it's near 100%. Once it's test positive, so we only need to rock to like a, um, rule out the possibility of contamination during the testing. So um, the source of the infection of the wild animals based on the studies, only less than one person, uh, around one person of people actually has direct contact with animals. So the majority is from the infected people or asymptomatic patients. So asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic patients still do exist, but we don't know currently.
preserved percentage for gum. On this patient, they actually can transmit virus based on the report. There's a woman who came from who came back uh, who came from Wuhan, and she actually transmitted this virus to all of her five, five family members. So the trans transmission was definitely airborne. So close contact and the vomit. So this virus can survive like uh, several hours on the surface. So that's possible. And also for the fecal and oral, so the virus will test positive in the stool and uh, urine samples. So there's another po possible like transmission route. And also mother to children. So uh, in early February, there was like an infant mom, just they were a baby. So the baby was test positive after 30 hours of first. So that might be suggested it might be possible. So everyone actually is susceptible to this virus. So this basic is timeline of this outbreak. So I just want to point out, so on their December 26th, actually a local doctor report that unknown pneumonia cases. And only five days we see there's a cluster of disease which was linked to this six market. And the market was identified as outbreak hub and was shut down on January 1st. And the January 7th, we were able to identify these virus. Uh, actually, it's a normal coronavirus. And the first death were report on January 11th. And during this time, actually, the travel season in China. So mainly it's people who left the city for the spring festival. And uh, on January 19th, was their first cases was report outside of Hubei. And on January 20th, so the Chinese authority confirmed it's human to human transmission. And uh, during this time, so actually only four days, so the confirmed cases was report almost everywhere, except for Qinghai and Tibet, which is a little bit far away. So on January 23rd and 21st, the government uh, decided to suspend travel to and from Wuhan and the nearby cities. And by that time, we already have 830 cases. So um, by on February 11th, so the death toll actually passed 1,000. So before I show the data about their epidemic, I want to give a little bit of background information about their epic center, Wuhan. Uh, so Wuhan actually is located, uh, it's a capital city of um, Hubei province. It's located in the central part of China. It's the China transportation hub. hub it has the high-speed uh, high train, the air, the direct flight overseas. So Wuhan actually is a metropolitan city. You can imagine it's a city size like New York City. Mm -hmm. Wuhan has more than 19 million people. We believe more than uh, five million people actually left city, left the city during this spring festival. So this actually, this kind of like a figure shows the daily their numbers of travelers <coughs> from Wuhan. So that's that's the reason. Um, we, uh, that's actually this explain why this like disease just like spread so quickly to everywhere. So this map shows their epidemic in China. So their dark colors means more cases. So Hubei is their epic center. So how currently they have <coughs> more than 30, 33 K confirmed cases. And uh, all those kind of like uh, uh, province nearby, they have either have more than 500 or more than 1,000 confirmed cases. So this, this kind of city also like, a, um, there's like a nine cities nearby this, this kind of province. That's one of the reason it caused so huge kind of like a pandemic. So by this morning, so we have like a 44K cases and the suspect cases was 16, 16K and like almost 5K people were discharged. So the discharge criteria means you have no fever for three days without medication and the RT-PCR was negative for every four, 24 hours for three days. So those people, even though they live in the hospital, so we still rec recommend these people self-quarantine at home. So the, nu the number of deaths is over 1,000, so the overall fatality actually is 2.5, the national fatality. But we think Hubei is like over 3%, but outside it's only 0.4%. So I believe this number actually reflects the true fatalities of this virus if we got enough like healthcare resource. 
Um, this, these figures show the, the cumulative like confirmed cases over time. This like uh, this line, this uh, yellow line means it's national. The orange means it's Hubei, and this like a uh, pink one means actually it's Wuhan, the city. So we can see like uh, more than seventy five percent of cases was located in Hubei province, but more than fifty percent of cases were actually in the city. And this uh, this chart shows actually their newly confirmed cases over time. Those kind of yellow line is means suspect cases. And this kind of pink one means the newly confirmed cases. We do see these share the same trend uh, from the January 20th to February 4th. We do see there's kind of like a, in, like a rapidly increasing over the time. And after February 4th, there's kind of like a flat period over time, but still the trend is kind of decreasing. So this like the newly confirmed cases um, break down by location. So the first one, this orange one is the national, and this like a dark red is Hubei, and the pink is the outside of Hubei. Uh, we basically see their trend is the same thing. They all like how increasing before February fourth and decreasing after that. So this chart is for the fatality rate over time. So we can see like outside of those Hubei actually pretty stable around like 0.4 percent. And uh, their national actually is driven by their like uh, death rate, the fatality rate of, uh, of Hubei. There's kind of like a peak over here. So it's the early stage of their the disease outbreak. So there are like thousands of like, uh, patients. So basically, so their health care system almost crashed. So they don't have enough like a bath to prepare <coughs> for these severe cases, especially those cases they need uh, ICU support. So I just show some several fit, um, picture of the how we respond to this kind of like this large scale outbreak. So first, when they know there's the cases, so they send they send the like a uh, expert to investigate. So this this person is actually pretty famous in China. He's the leading person during the SARS, and he is also the leading person for this kind of investigation. They shuttle down their outbreak their outbreak hub. They um. Uh, they were able to isolate uh, these virus and uh, and share the genome to all other countries. So it's pretty critical for uh, for the world uh, to help develop develop the kit, the testing kit. And uh, we were gated uh, this city. So even though this city was gated, actually, lots of people going there for support and resource going there. So. We are building two new hospitals within two weeks. They provide actually more than two, two uh, K beds for the severe cases, and all those like locations they were either to be like sports center, schools, commercial center. They turn this area into the their cabin hospitals. They provide uh, their healthcare service for the mild cases. In the meantime, they, they try to quarantine these people and make sure they don't spread the virus in the community. So this actually, this kind of hospital looks like. This hospital was basically using the containers. Uh, that's the reason they were able to build it uh, so quickly. Uh, this is uh, their, their, like, uh, how it looks like for their cabin hospital. So they have like healthcare providers. They have like on uh, the mobile x-ray, the mobile pharmacy, and also the mobile P3 uh, and the like, labs over there. They basically can function well as like a hospital. So there are thousands of healthcare providers. Uh, they, out, um, they come into the city and into the state to expand healthcare facilities over there. So take care of the patients and take care of the communities. So those four people actually they are both like a lab, like a, a technician. They're experts for their like RA testing. Those people are from China CDC where I used to work with. Uh, those are my mentors. I wish they could keep healthy over there and to fight this like an epidemic. So those people they are working in the community. So these community health workers they will see to explore the new suspect <coughs> cases. They transfer this uh, this suspect cases to healthcare facility and help them to get diagnosis. And also they advocate their residency. They uh, disinfect uh, they disinfect these public areas. For the individual level, 
So we just gave like a lot of education. <coughs> like stay at home, stay healthy. That's basically this means. And uh, in the meantime, we just like uh, have a lot of education about like uh, how you should wear the mask. <coughs> what is the proper way? And how to dis uh, disinfection of all those kind of like household dust. So in the meantime, we also allow the WHO expert go there and help uh, to do this investigation. There are like scientists working in the lab to selecting drugs, conduct a lot of clinical trial to test the efficacy. Also, there is a study there try to develop rapid testing, which can be used in the communities. And also, the government extended their spring festival, so encourage, encourage people stay at home for people who, who need to return back to work. So they actually suggest you need to stay at home for 14 days before you actually return back to work. So I think with all those kind of tremendous like effort, we quarantine the like south of the infectious, we cut the transmission route, we protect all those suspected population. It's just a matter of time. We will, we will, we should be able to uh, control this ep epidemic in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a doctor or an epidemiologist, so you should, you should take that in this spirit. But what I uh, have spent the past oh, almost 20 years uh, doing on and off uh, is studying the public health system and infectious disease control in China from a sociocultural point of view. So I have a little bit of a different perspective, and I'm going to kind of zoom out from the virus itself and the... the um, the actual case counts and that kind of thing to think about sort of uh, the broader uh, social impacts of what's going on. So uh, I was asked to share, first of all, the, what we learned from the SARS epidemic or what China learned. And uh, I did write a book about this, so I do have some things to say. Um, so I would say the number one lesson learned from SARS for the Chinese public health system and the Chinese leadership more broadly was that preventing another SARS should be their number one public health priority. Um, and that's over and above any more mundane domestic public health priorities. So uh, in my book, I speak a little bit to the ramifications of that really uh, strong focus on exact preparing for exactly this event. Um, this priority drove a major rethinking and remodeling of the public health system. So that was oriented around preventing uh, the emergence of new diseases and containing them if they should happen. And so you see that a little bit in Gentile's talk about just how prepared actually uh, people were to be trying to do something on this scale. Um, a huge amount of money and resources from the central government, local governments, and foreign sources poured into local public health systems following SARS which supported the hiring of highly skilled and highly educated workforce, the purchasing of high-tech equipment to detect, test for, and analyze new viruses, and the development of a surveillance and reporting system that all local health officials were supposed to utilize to report cases of potential new diseases in a timely fashion to a higher level official. Um, so when I give that explanation, people then tend to ask, well, how did we get to this point then? They were so um, so one reason is that the, the image a lot of people have of China's uh, authoritarian powers in obtaining information or enforcing any sort of response at the local level is, is highly overblown. So the central government is very effective in implementing extreme control measures like we are seeing now uh, with the country effectively on lockdown. But on a sort of daily, everyday basis, they rely heavily on local systems to collect and pass on disease surveillance information, and in practice have actually very little power under normal circumstances to enforce, uh, to enforce people actually doing that. Um, China's system can be described as what uh, the scholar Kenneth Lieberthal has referred to as fragmented authoritarianism, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It operates like a collection of little fiefdoms at the local level 
and each and there's very little ability on the part of the central government to compel ongoing action in any one of these fiefdoms, except under the kinds of extraordinary circumstances we're seeing now. Um, there also are large disincentives to report a new disease at the local level, and there's been a lot of reporting about this in the press. Um, proper, proper reporting requires that an individual local level doctor or public health worker report to their immediate boss that they're seeing something new and alarming. But frankly, no one wants to do that. Um, doing so has very little benefit to the person at the local level and may have immediate serious repercussions for them personally and professionally and politically. Um, because no low level official wants their institution or city to be the source of an outbreak like this, uh, which may embarrass them and cause economic and political repercussions in exactly the way we're seeing for Wuhan now. Um, so there's a lot of pressure locally, in fact, to not report at the local level. You won't be told that, but there's implicit pressure. Um, and many people also who are on the immediate front lines of this um, on a daily basis see upwards on a regular day 100 to 200 patients a day. So if you can picture in the middle of winter, right, it's very hard to distinguish a new virus from any other respiratory viruses that are circulating and to get that kind of accurate data even if you wanted to. Um, finally, as we saw with the doctor who has now become something of a martyr to a lot of Chinese people, uh, Li Wenliang, one who just recently died, he's sometimes called a whistleblower on the initial outbreak, um, individual doctors do not have the power or the right in China to report new cases of disease directly to the outside world. It's, it's illegal. Um, new viruses are still officially state secrets, um, and so only provincial or central governments have the power to report on them to the outside world, including international colleagues or the domestic or international press. So what Lee did was, in fact, breaking the law, and that's why he was reprimanded. Um, but people are very unhappy about that now, as, as you would see if you looked on Chinese social media recently. Um, the other important aspect of this, of course, is the current containment response, both domestically in China and globally. And one of the big takeaways that the Chinese government at both the central and local levels got from SARS was that draconian actions are necessary to control a new virus if it does occur, that China is particularly good at taking such actions, and that China will be praised by the international community if it does so, as long as it's within its own borders. And so during SARS, China did a lot of things domestically that would not be really possible anywhere else, and which we're now seeing again in even uh, more exaggerated form, mass quarantines of healthy people, rapidly building hospitals in a matter of days, setting up neighborhood watch systems um, for people to report on their neighbors if they suspect someone might be infected and round them up and that sort of thing. Um, the WHO has praised them for these actions, both then and now, and um, I think it is important to note that those actions would not be possible, and in some cases, acceptable or even legal in most of the other member countries. Um, so for those who think that the, the containment measures being taken in China in the name of protecting the rest of the world are a reasonable precaution, I would just invite you as a sort of um, exercise to imagine what would happen if the US government decided to seal off and confine to their homes the entire northeastern portion of the United States from Washington to Maine, which is the population that's currently under, under very strong lockdown. The whole country is sort of under lockdown. No one's going out of their apartment, but um, in terms of Hubei province. Um, and then if they further put checkpoints on all of the interstate highways, shut down public transportation across the whole country, made laws about when people are allowed to leave their homes, all for an indefinite period of time in order to prevent an epidemic here from spreading outside of the United States to somewhere else. Um, I invite you to further imagine how we would feel if the WHO praised those actions and said that's what we should be doing. Um, and what our action would be if the entire world started shutting down its borders with the US, evacuating their citizens from our country, shutting down trade routes, and barring US citizens from traveling for a disease that, as Jintel pointed it out, outside of Hubei has a 0.4% mortality rate. Nothing to see that, but not exactly Ebola. Um, just as a point of comparison, in 2009, we had another novel pandemic of a new respiratory virus, H1N1 flu, which I don't know if any of you remember. Um, that flu pandemic eventually did kill about 200,000 people worldwide, uh, but the outbreak began in North America, 
instead of China. And actually in 2009, I was doing uh, my dissertation research with local public health institutions in southeastern China. And at the time, from their point of view, they were actually uh, expecting at first the US to lock down its borders in a similar manner to what China is doing now uh, to prevent US citizens from carrying a new virus around the world and infecting other people. But at the time, the WHO and CDC dismissed such a suggestion as a massive overreaction and when Chinese authorities did attempt to quarantine some foreign citizens entering their country in order to prevent that virus from, from getting in, there was an indignant outcry from the international community that they were overreacting and being xenophobic, um, and that they needed to just accept that the flu was going to spread around the world and not make futile attempts to contain the inevitable, instead switch to a, you know, dealing with, with the aftermath of that. So, uh, I'm not trying to suggest what we should be doing now, but I think it's useful to put these things in a little bit of perspective. Um, a couple more things that I want to note briefly. One is that while the Chinese public health system prepared for a long time to prevent a new virus from arising, there wasn't a lot of preparation that went into treating people for a domestic outbreak. The really big focus was on preventing it from happening in the first place. Um, so what we see in Wuhan right now is uh, a real problem in terms of triaging and treating the sick um, that, as Juntel suggested, is heavily driving up fatality rates beyond what they would probably otherwise be. Um, panicked and trapped citizens were, have been rushing to the hospital at the first sign of a sniffle, which again, it's February, so a lot of people have sniffles. Um, hospitals have been overwhelmed with thousands of people who probably don't have the virus, but are far more likely to contact it after waiting around for hours in crowded hospitals with people who do have the virus, right? It's a really wonderful way, almost as good as the cruise ship that, uh, <laughs> in terms of how to spread a virus. Um, meanwhile, those with other diseases and urgent health needs are not able to get timely care because they're just, everyone's so focused on this. Um, officials have at least attempted to count the number of people who have died from the outbreak in China, but we really have no idea how many people have died from other causes made worse by the lockdown and chaos, uh, including ordinary influenza, but also diabetes, heart disease, stroke, whatever. Um, so we have to remember that just because a new virus is here does not mean that people have magically stopped getting sick from other things. And I think we sometimes lose track of that. Um, or needing to go to the hospital for other things. So we need to look at the big picture when we're thinking about the cost and benefit of various disease control responses and the fallout from both the disease and the response and not only think about it as if this is the only thing happening um, in people's lives. Finally, one thing I want to note on another, in kind of another area that's radically different in China now as compared with SARS is the role of social media. Um, so during SARS, people did share information that was outside of the sort of government approved news, but it was mostly by word of mouth. Now in 2020, with hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens cooped up at home with nothing better to do but to look at their social media accounts, and people are really bored. <laughs> um, there is an explosion of online information, disinformation, and discontent, the likes of which um, the folks who try to control information and in the central government have not really, frankly, ever had to deal with before. I mean, most of the time, people, they know that things are censored, but you don't really care because it's not really affecting your everyday life, and you're not spending all day on Weibo, which is Chinese Twitter, or um, WeChat, or whatever. But, when you have nothing better to do than do that, you notice a lot more. Um, so we are seeing anger about censorship and government failures to be transparent in ways that I haven't seen before. So it's, it'll be quite interesting to see what, if any, long-term fallout we have from that as well. And I'm gonna stop there. Matt, is your question. Mm -hmm. Great, so thank you. Uh, so I'm here on behalf of the Rhode Island Department of Health, uh, representing Dr. Uh, Alexander Scott, who sent recruiting, he couldn't be here. So let me start by asking questions. So these are your options. Very concerned, a little bit concerned, not concerned. So before you walked in today, how many people were very concerned about what was happening? A little concerned bit about for our own health or our global Your own health. Health. Oh, no. Not global. Uh, so no. Here, Rhode Island, your own health. How many people are very concerned that we are, that this is a problem? A little bit concerned? Not concerned at all. So interesting. So one thing to keep in mind. So talking about the public health response and sort of balancing, you know, autonomy with, um, with uh, you know, potentially rights, um, you know, 
know, when the first reports came out of China, right, there was the, the first case series, if you look back, reported a 15% mortality rate, right? And so we've talked about subsequent data. Um, so a lot of the decisions that have been made early on were really focused on, and there's been a history for that, right? As Dr. Chow mentioned, the SAR, mortality rate of SARS was 10%. Mortality rate of, uh, of MERS was about 30 to 40%. So people were incredibly concerned, and given that this virus had a lot of, um, a lot of similarity to SARS, people you know, assumed that the mortality rate was going to be very high. And so you know, this outbreak is actually, it's, it's been an amazing public health response, if you think about it. So the, the CDC has implemented quarantine procedures. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, when someone has disease and infection, we isolate them to protect other people, right? When people have no symptoms, but have potentially been exposed, that's quarantine. So no symptoms, asymptomatic. And so the United States, for the first time in like 50 years, has implemented quarantine procedures in certain people coming from China. So is that right? Is it wrong? You know, that's debatable. Um, but I think it, this has scared a lot of people, and a lot of people are very concerned. Dr. Chow, Chow mentioned we have seen 13 cases in the United States. The closest case was Massachusetts, right, from a couple weeks ago. Um, so a lot of the states are very concerned. So what is what do the public health departments do? You know, what is Rhode Island doing? So the first off, it's the CDC has really taken ownership of this, right? They've allocated, I've seen some reports, about 800 staff and personnel at the federal level to monitor and, and look at this outbreak. So one of the things that the local public health departments do, including Rhode Island, is we are on daily conference calls with the CDC taking direction. So when the CDC says quarantine people, who do you think quarantines? It's the Rhode Island Department of Health that will implement that. So we're getting passenger lists, right? We're getting lists from the CDC of people that have traveled to mainland China, to Wuhan, and the Hubei province. Um, so the Rhode Island Department of Health has really taken a lot of direction from the CDC. So I've been involved in daily uh, meetings about what we're doing here in the state. So the first off is, uh, is taking direction from the CDC. The other thing that I think is often underappreciated by the local health departments is surveillance. So just monitoring what's going on. I think that that's also been a challenge coming out of China, right? Is that some of the data has not been, has been a little bit questionable due to their public health reporting. In general, I think they have a very robust infrastructure, and it's concerning that this virus may spread to other countries or continents that have less robust um, infrastructure, um, Africa, some other parts of Southeast Asia. I mean, in general, China can set up a hospital in a few days' time, which is really remarkable if you think about it, but a lot of countries don't have capacity to do that. So part of it is just gathering and synthesizing and surveillance of information, and we do this for all you know, HIV, STDs, et cetera, but don't underestimate just the role that the CDC and the, and the local health departments have on synthesizing and capturing the data so that we can make decisions about what to do, right? Because if we're not monitoring, there could be you know, 10,000 people already in Rhode Island that have coronavirus, right? If no one's watching, you know, what do you do about it? The other thing, so this is my first, so I've been with the health department for about five or six years now. Um, so H1N1, as you mentioned, came out about 10 years ago, and it seems like every, you know, once or twice every decade, something like this happens. One thing that's really impressed me at the Department of Health is the communication between the two. And when I first sort of started, you know, you know, being part of these meetings, it's like, well, you know, why are half the people here dealing with communications? And I quickly learned that in, in an outbreak setting, managing uh, to, to the population is critical. Um, and not just the population, but also providers. So the other couple things that the Department of Health is doing, as most public health departments, are managing communications and how, um, how messaging is related to the population and also engaging the local clinical staff in assessing the capacity to respond to an outbreak. And that's the other thing that the Department of Health is doing. So we actually have the capacity to open up makeshift hospitals in the state, should the need arise. So that hopefully doesn't get there, obviously. Um, but there is capacity. There's ventilation units um, in storage. There's, there's tremendous capacity for, for personal protective equipment, et cetera, um, for the Rhode Island Department of Health providers. How many people have, uh, have bought masks? bought a, a pack of masks, or anything? No, if you go on Amazon, they're actually all sold out. <laughs> so that's another problem, too. So looking at issues like this, right? If you go to Amazon and you try to buy an N95 mask, they're sold out. And in fact, the ones that we use at the hospital, they're selling for like 100 bucks online for single masks. Which is so, so there's already, in some circles, some degree of panic, right, happening um, among the population. And this is also driving, uh, you know, reducing resources that hospitals have to, to use. So the Department of Health is monitoring issues like that in terms of uh, protecting personal equipment. If you look at some of the reports uh, being published in the Lancet and JAMA, 
Um, in some case series, about 40% of all hospital patients are actually healthcare workers um, who are infected with the virus. So um, understanding how the virus is transmitted, currently it's recommended that you do have an N95 mask, as well as goggles, gloves, and, and protection as well. So luckily, uh, this virus seems to be mostly transmitted through respiratory droplets, which means you have to be about three to six feet from someone. So this is different than, say, measles or varicella or chickenpox, where I could be talking to you and you all could be exposed to measles right now. So that's maybe a future consideration, and that's sort of our, you know, one of the most terrifying things if you have a virus like this, um, is that it could be spread through air the final thing I want to sort of just point out in terms of people's minds is that we talked a lot about mortality, so it does appear, of course, that the mortality rate may be around 2%, as I mentioned, and, and elsewhere it's about 0.4%. Uh, but the other important thing to consider, um, and this happened with SARS, is that uh, the, the, the need for invasive ventilation is uh, much higher than that percentage. Meaning for SARS, it's 10% mortality rate, but 20 to 30% of people require intubation and ventilation support. And similarly with MERS, it was 30 to 40 percent uh, mortality rate, but 80 plus percent required ventilation. And if you look at some of these case series, yes, they had about you know five, 10 percent of hospitalized patients were dying, but 40 plus percent were requiring ventilation support. And so that's a concern in terms of resource, right? How many ICU beds are in Rhode Island Hospital? 20, right? How many are in Mary Hospital? 15. So not just the the, the ability to overwhelm the hospitals, but also the the invasive respiratory needs have been, have been a major concern. So these are all things that the Department of Health is looking at. And I would actually encourage, I know there's a lot of leaders for the School of Public Health. I think things like this, when they occur, um, for people that are interested, there's also a lot of students here. Like, this is an amazing time, actually, to learn from some of these outbreak response. So maybe it's a potential to send a couple students over at some point to learn about how the Department of Health is responding to things like that. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I think I'll stop there. Um, and happy to take questions after. everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to give a slightly different perspective. I feel like I, I'm sitting in the middle of uh, Babushka doll, you know, <laughs> where we've sort of gone from the macro and we're, we're sort of narrowing our perspective down to sort of the local, um, more micro level. And so I'm bringing the perspective of uh, how we're preparing and managing questions and, and concerns and screening for um, this uh, for coronavirus, but certainly we're at the height of flu season. So how do we sort of uh, manage all of those kind of things? Um, so I would say that uh, the work that we're doing is really built on lessons that we learned from H1N1 back in 2009. Some of us who've been in college health, student health uh, for a very, very long time um, remember what happened uh, back then, and some of us may have it even a little PTSD because it was life before and life after. But we did learn a lot. And so those of us who are here to working together are drawing from all of those lessons. Um, uh, at Brown, at the health service, we have an operations team that is uh, comprised of all of the areas of the health service, so nursing and um, administration and the clinicians, et cetera. And there have been policies and procedures that have been developed, again, mostly learning from what we learned around uh, H1N1. And that team is coming together regularly, uh, at least twice weekly, um, but certainly meeting and, and, and talking um, on a daily basis as needed. Um, we're monitoring information coming out of uh, the Department of, of Health. In fact, we had a call today that was earmarked specifically for colleges and universities. When you think about it, the 11 or so colleges and universities here in Rhode Island are um, natural um, uh, homes for people from all over the world. And so um, our academic calendars are different, which uh, represent times when people are coming and going, and our <coughs> populations are, are international and, and, uh, and uh, and span the globe. So we have been, I think, challenged in unique kinds of ways to think about the populations that we serve um, from the standpoint of students as well as faculty and staff who are, who are visiting and, and who are, who are um, uh, 
uh, teaching in our, in our colleges and universities. And so we've been following CDC guidelines, World Health Organization guidelines, and, and again, managing communication has been the, the biggest issue um, to make sure that we're not making up our own rules um, you know, we, I think the first week or two that um, we started to get information about coronavirus, the rumors were just flying. Um, you can only imagine. Um, over a course of a weekend, we went from, you know, releasing someone who potentially had coronavirus to um, um, being part of a, um, a WeChat group who, who uh, were convinced that we had that same person had gone off to a party, and then by the end of the weekend, that person was at Rhode Island Hospital, and the Projo was calling to ask, you know, what what was going on. So um, we're really trying to um, keep the information clear and simple and consolidated, and have it be uh, again um, consistent with what we're learning from from our colleagues in, at the CDC and the Department of, of Health. Um, so in addition to, to the operations team uh, at the health service, all of the staff have been trained um, our, from our, our, the medical assistants who answer the phone in terms of appropriate screening questions to um, all of the uh, protective, personal protective equipment that people should be wearing should uh, uh, someone call and indicate that they may uh, potentially uh, have um, a need to be screened. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, colleagues at the Department of Health that we are in consultation with and have provisions on campus for um, housing if we needed to isolate a, a student who was not uh, going to be hospitalized for, for uh, some period of time. And so we, what we do at the health service then dovetails on to a larger scale cri core crisis team um, that is responsible for emergency preparedness across the university. And represented on that team um, are uh, members of the um, Environmental Health and, and Safety uh, Office. We have our uh, Global Health Team, um, members of the, um, the academic side of the house, so the Provost Office is represented, um, and the Health Service. We have just we really blanket the campus in terms of thinking about the systems that are interconnected and that need to be in communication with each other. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest messages for us um, are to communicate to students to do the things that they can do. And that is, you know, the, the, the influenza and, uh, and cold and, and um, respiratory virus prevention measures, washing your hands, getting a flu shot, you know, covering, you know, covering your cough, all of those things are really important and we're, we're reinforcing those messages to the community because that is the, the best ammunition we have right now. Uh, in fact, we have a, a campaign called 5K by Valentine's Day in terms of flu shots and we, we passed that a, a week or so ago. So that's good news. Um, we're doing the things that we can. So again, I will also be available to take questions and uh, look forward to to answer that.